top of the morning to you. This is Taki Ta. Today we are looking at the eighth installment of Hannibal Marching on Rome. And again, as always, be sure to check out the original link down in the description down below for the original content creator. Go give History March the love and support they well deserve. Again, as always, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And let's get started. It's late in the year 217 BC. Destroyed towns and burned farmland stretch as far as the eye can see. Hannibal had plundered the Agaphalanus Valley, perhaps the richest region in all of Rome. But he is now surrounded and trapped by a more numerous Roman army, led by a general who seems to know all about his old tricks. With cold weather approaching, the Carthaginian general is running out of time. Yeah, now he's he's running around in Rome. He stays in Rome for a long time, but there's a missed opportunity to march on Rome and now he's running out of supplies. He has to keep the morale up. He has m large portions of his Gallic army that possibly have lost heart and went back home. It's summer 217 BC. Having decided not to march on Rome, Hannibal went back across the Apennine Mountains. He ordered that all military-aged Roman males that were encountered on the march were to be killed. But the Carthaginian general had reasons to worry. His army fought in three battles without ever fully recovering from the crossing of the Alps, and by now the men showed signs of scurvy and the horses of mange, both caused by vitamin deficiency. Yeah, that, that would suck. Scurvy's terrible. And bleeding gums, losing your teeth, high fever, fatigue, and mange is, yeah. After 10 days, the Carthaginian army reached the Adriatic Sea. Hannibal allowed the men to recover through eating the plentiful produce gathered from this rich area. The horses were bathed in the sour wine, which had been captured in great quantities to restore the condition of their coats. There you go. Meanwhile, Publius Cornelius Scipio was sent as proconsul to Iberia with reinforcements of some 30 new ships, oh, wow. 8,000 troops, and fresh supplies. Does that. Yeah, because that's their main way home, too. Like, unless Carthage has enough boats, which they, they do have enough boats, but he it's, he's not going to be able to march his entire army on all those boats to actually go back home. And they're trying to get Rome to surrender on favorable terms, really. Uh, but the Romans have so much heart, there's no surrender even in their mind, it's it's all or nothing. Kill or be killed. They will destroy you, or I will des destroy them. What persuaded the Senate to divert such valuable resources to Iberia at a time when Hannibal was on that's a path they of were destruction? Winning. In it that's like one of the main arenas over the uh, over south of the Pyrenees that they were actually winning. So it's okay. Let's double down on that because that they have to come back this way eventually. Italy was their desire to prevent reinforcements from reaching Hannibal by land. And that. But more importantly, it was the Senate's determination upon a long-term Roman involvement in Iberia, made possible by Nias's success on the... Yeah, and that's... I mean, they've already carved out a pretty good little possession down there. And I mean, that's... They're at that choke point in the Pyrenees. And... I mean, it's, why not take the Iberian Peninsula while you're at it? I mean, it's, it's good land. On the battlefield at Tarico, Nebro, 
as well as his flexible diplomatic methods through which he forged treaties of neutrality and alliances that brought many Iberian tribes to the... And it would kind of, like, because they already control, see, like, um, Sardinia and all of that. Roman side. It is Nias' ability to act autonomously without waiting for directives from Rome that gave the Senate a strategic advantage halfway across the Mediterranean, where they could otherwise exert no direct control. The Senate felt assured that by supporting the Scipio brothers in Iberia, Rome would have good prospects for fighting the Carthaginians in their own backyard. Huh. Back in Italy, with the army restored to health, Hannibal continued advancing down the coast. He sent a message by sea to Carthage, reporting on the situation in Italy. He needs reinforcements. The Carthaginian Senate expressed delight with his progress and promised aid to support his campaign. Win. <laughs> Meanwhile, the appointed dictator, Quintus Fabius Maximus, took command of Geminus's remaining four legions and went after Hannibal. Replacement of the terrible losses at Lake Trasimene required an emergency levy of two additional legions, which brought the dictator's wow. army to around 40,000, including allies. Oh. It is possible that some of the new recruits were very young and older men, originally intended for Rome's city garrison, with some in the process of being trained while on the march. That's some green troops, man. Fabius was a man in his late 50s, rather old by the standards of Roman generals, but he was a proven commander. Having been awarded a triumph for his victory over the Ligurians oh. during his consulship in 233 BC, he also held the position of censor in 230 and was elected wow. consul again in 228. All right, so he's pretty distinguished. I'm sure he's earned his stripes to be awarded dictator. Now as dictator, he was yet to reveal his plan on how he will deal with Hannibal. So far, he had been advancing cautiously, carefully scouting ahead to give himself plenty of warning of the enemy's presence. Okay. Meanwhile, Hannibal pillaged and burned his way down the coast, accumulating vast quantities of grain, cattle, and other produce. His plan was to reach southern Italy, where he expected to sway some of Rome's allies to join him. The two commanders met for the first time in northern Apulia, encamping just 10 kilometers apart. Hannibal immediately offered battle outside the Roman camp. But no response came from Fabius. Interesting. The Carthaginian general waited long enough to impress his own men with the enemy's timidity before leading the army back into camp. The following morning, Hannibal continued the march, ravaging the countryside as he went in an attempt to goad Fabius into battle. He provokingly well, went past... Yeah, dang, I mean, he was trying to aggro them out of their defensive fort. Walking right next to them. ...the Roman army back into the Apennine Mountains. But the Roman dictator merely followed the enemy and apparently had no intention of risking a battle under any circumstances. This was certainly wise, as not And because if the dictator did lose, then really that's like Rome's last leg really nearly half of his army was made up of raw recruits yeah. and some of the men were in awe of Hannibal who had defeated the Roman armies on three occasions that year but Fabius's strategy wasn't too popular in Rome notwithstanding the disasters of the Trebia and Trasimene yeah. powerful I'm sure the Senate doesn't like it and the common citizens being that their entire countryside is being raided and ransacked. All elements of the Roman Senate still believed that Hannibal could be defeated in a pitched battle. Although he was appointed dictator, the Senate restricted Fabius's freedom of action by denying him the right to choose his own second in command. Instead, they huh. foisted upon him Marcus Minucius Rufus, a former consul. Huh. Nevertheless, as Hannibal continued across the Apennines, Fabius shadowed him. The hilly country favoured the Romans, allowing Fabius to stick to the high ground 
and only encamp in positions that Hannibal would never risk attacking. The dictator's plan was to deprive the enemy of food supplies by launching small-scale attacks on Carthaginian foraging parties, not inflicting many casualties, but making it difficult for them to gather food and fodder. But he would never risk a direct confrontation. Fabius also instructed inhabitants of surrounding villages to take with them all of the animals and food they can before destroying and burning everything that's left behind and seek refuge in fortified towns. Doing a little scorched earth strategy. This tactic, which would later become known as the Fabian strategy, served not only to deplete Hannibal's forces, but also to gradually rebuild Roman military confidence. Hannibal understood that he needed to force an open battle in order to exploit the tactical superiority of his own army and prevent the situation from developing into an exhausting war of attrition that he cannot sustain. He clearly yeah. appreciated the implications to his war effort if Fabius would continue with this new strategy. But the cunning Carthaginian general had a plan. Fabius showed great skill to keep close to the enemy without giving him an opportunity to fight. But by the time Hannibal passed the walled city of Beneventum, the Roman army had fallen two days' march behind. The Carthaginian general planned to enter Campania and devastate the Agathalanus, perhaps the richest area in Rome, famous for its exquisite wines and fertile land that made it the breadbasket of the Republic. Wow. He felt that threatening such a prominent area, inhabited by Roman citizens, would either provoke Fabius into giving battle or demonstrate, at last, Rome's weakness, which would, hopefully, make Capua, Rome's second largest city, along with other cities, switch sides. Upon entering the valley, well, Hannibal unleashed a his... Very open area. Like, if you're going to have a pitch battle, I mean, it's... That to be easily surrounded, though, by Romans. Troops, ordering them to strip the region of supplies and then burn all that remained. Immense amounts of valuables were taken, as well as vast quantities of supplies and cattle. While Fabius' strategy was already unpopular, now his political power began crumbling as quickly as the burning rich estates and villas. Yeah, I'm sure that wasn't possible. But even when urged to seek battle by an angry Minucius, as well as other officers and displeased troops, the under pressure Fabius would have none of it. Even though the Agathalanus was burning, it was not enough to bring him down from the hills to challenge the Carthaginians. Wow. It seems that Hannibal was the only one who understood the implications of Fabius's plan. Hannibal failed to provoke an open battle, and despite the vast plunder that was taken, it was clear that he could not winter in the valley, as it couldn't sustain his army until spring. He needed to establish a base where his army could winter and enjoy the spoils of its raiding. Several points led out from the valley, but Fabius had already strengthened the garrisons on the river to the south and placed small contingents on the eastern and western ends of the valley. Trying to force his way through any of these fortified points would be dangerous for Hannibal. And his plan was to come back the way he came, where he already knew the lay of the land. But the Roman dictator stationed 4,000 legionaries on higher ground that would block the pass through which Hannibal intended to exit. And he encamped with the rest of the army on the hillside further west from where he could attack the Carthaginian rear once they tried to march out of the valley. Uh, so he's trapped. Now Hannibal seems to be pigeonholed. Hannibal knew he was hemmed in, and that once his supplies dwindled, he would be forced to launch a direct attack against fortified Roman positions on unfavorable terrain where his cavalry would be unusable. And the longer he waited, the worse his situation would become. So he began making preparations. Huh. Finally, a few weeks into the stalemate, Hannibal ordered the troops to eat a hearty supper and go to bed early, to get as much rest as possible for the night ahead. As all activities in the three camps quietened down, 
The guards remained on their posts, and the campfires lit up the night sky. It seemed like another uneventful day had ended. But about an hour before daybreak, a mass of torches appeared, heading across a small ridge in front of the pass. It seemed that Hannibal decided to force his way out after all. Thinking they were being outflanked, the 4,000 Roman troops holding the pass left their position to block the enemy's movement. Little did they know that the column of torches weren't enemy soldiers, but wow. thousands of captured oxen with burning branches tied to their horns, guided by Carthaginian camp followers. Upon reaching the milling animals, the legionnaires halted in confusion. Then, out of the darkness, came about 2,000 Iberian javelinmen. Although outnumbered two to one, they were more nimble than the heavily armoured Romans, and more accustomed to fighting in rugged terrain. As the fighting raged on the ridge, Hannibal was already moving with the rest of his army. That's a good flanking maneuver. It's kind of a little bait and switch. In total silence. And that really shows like the the discipline that he has over his troops. He planned to flank the Roman contingent through a very narrow passage that was now left unguarded. Fabius saw the torchlight and heard the noise of the fighting, but refused to move from his camp in the darkness, despite the urgings of his officers and Minucius in particular. Given the problems of fighting a night battle and the relative inexperience of his soldiers, Fabius probably made the correct decision. He had no way of knowing whether or not Hannibal was setting up another trap, and it is questionable whether the Romans would have been able to locate and intercept the enemy wow. in time. Hannibal was able to ascend the pass and escape with his army and plunder intact. That's intense. As daylight broke, the Carthaginian general reacted quicker than his opponent, sending a force of Iberian infantry from the rear of the column to support the embattled and outnumbered troops on the ridge. The lightly armed and agile infantry managed not only to relieve the javelinmen, but inflicted heavy losses on the Roman contingent. Dang. There you go. The way in which Hannibal extricated his army from a seemingly hopeless situation became a classic of ancient generalship, finding its way into nearly every historical narrative of the war and being used by later military manuals. Yeah. Fabius had been humiliated for allowing his enemy to escape. Even before Agathalanus, many in Rome and within the army resented the dictator's passive strategy. Yeah, now that made the dictator even less popular. But while Fabius's political reputation suffered, his troops actually gained valuable experience under his leadership. More importantly, he prevented Hannibal from potentially destroying another Roman army, which would have undoubtedly persuaded many of Rome's allies to defect. Yeah, because if Rome tried to attack him in the middle of the night, he, they probably would have lost because Hannibal has some elite troops and the dictator only has young and old greenhorns, really, that especially aren't familiar with fighting at night. And now he was following Hannibal back across the Apennines. The two commanders would meet again. Damn. If you ever wondered how we create a- That is intense. Be sure to stay tuned for part eight here soon and as always be sure to check out the original link down in the description down below let me know your thoughts down below if you were in Hannibal's position and you weren't able to cross that narrow way and pull this off like Hannibal did what would you do let me know and I'll see you on the next one cheers